So welcome everyone to the final segment of the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, a program that is sponsored by Bristol Community College's Affirmative Action Committee. Uh, and I'm one of the co-chairs, but I'd like to introduce my other co-chair, Rasmi Penn, who has been the driving force behind this, uh, this month. And so I want to give him a big hand. Um, I am thrilled to have the honor of pre presenting Professor Emeritus James Kajia to speak to you regarding his insights on American history as a Japanese American. Uh, professor Hajia was a professor of history at UMass Dartmouth for 25 years, uh, teaching an array of American history courses, didn't line up any, anything uh, about American history he was involved. Uh, he's also a member of the American Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians, and has written several books and many articles for publication. Uh, sometimes Professor Hajia writes to the Standard Times and I always find his articles very insightful, so sometimes you might see it. If you read the Standard, how many people read the Standard Times? Okay. <laughs> All right, please welcome <laughs> Professor Hajia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pollock, uh, Raxme, and the uh, members of the committee uh, that organized this uh, uh, whole Heritage, uh, Asian Pacific uh, American Heritage Month. And thank you, students, uh, for coming, plus a few uh, non-students <laughs> I detect in the audience there. Uh, thanks all for being here. Uh, as, as Professor Pollock said, I'm retired from UMass Dartmouth. I retired almost 10 years ago. I haven't given a lecture in 10 years. <laughs> I'm probably a little rusty. I think I've probably forgotten how to give a proper lecture. And therefore, I'm going to have to give an improper lecture. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, first of all, do you all have copies of the handout? Uh, a couple people came in late. But, yeah, um, uh, on this handout, you'll it's two-sided. On one side, there's an outline uh, of the lecture, which includes names and dates and vocabulary terms and things like that. On the other side is a highly abridged version of my family tree, in which <laughs> I leave out my brother <laughs> and people. Uh, I leave out everybody whom I don't mention in today's lecture, but just to give you some sense of who I'm talking about uh, when I refer to members of my family. Now I'm here today to talk about uh, the Japanese American heritage, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about culture, uh, you know, things like language and even superstitions of the Japanese American uh, Americans. But mostly I'll talk about history because that's just what I do. <laughs> I uh, was trained as a historian, and in this lecture I'm going to use my own family uh, to illustrate uh, Japanese American history. Uh, the Japanese have been here in America for five generations. My family has been here for five generations, and so you know, I think they serve as a, a vehicle, a way of getting into uh, uh, this larger history. Uh, in this talk, however, I'm not going to talk equally about all five generations. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on the period of World War II. Uh, that is when the most interesting events in Japanese uh, American history happened. And of these interesting events, the most interesting was getting thrown in jail, <laughs> you know, when everybody was rounded up and put in a concentration camp. That's pretty interesting, you know, you kind of remember when something like that happens to you, even if you weren't born yet. <laughs> All right, so, so I'll, I'll focus on the 40s, although I will talk a little bit about other periods as well. Japanese Americans are a vanishing race, a dying breed. We're disappearing, <laughs> we're going away. Uh, this may surprise you because as you may have heard from other lectures in this series on Asian American history or Asian American heritage, most Asian American groups are growing. You know, the, the, uh, the two fastest growing you know, races or whatever in America are the Hispanics and the Asian Americans. Uh, but the Japanese Americans are different from the rest of the Asian Americans, whereas you know, most Asian groups are going up, up, up. We're <laughs> going the other way. We're going down. And I'll tell you why, <laughs> a little bit about that. First of all, the numbers. Uh, throughout the 20th century, 
the Japanese population was rising, you know, from 1900 to 1990. You know, the number of Japanese Americans was going higher every year. It peaked in 1990 when there were a little over 800,000 Japanese Americans. But then it started curving down. Uh, in 2000, the number was a little below 800,000. And by the latest census, 2010, uh, it was in the mid 700s. All right, so it's kind of up, 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 and then started heading down. Uh, there is no reason to believe that this decline will be reversed, uh, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, the, the population of Japanese Americans will diminish. How come? Well, there are at least four reasons for the decline of Japanese America. The main reason, the fundamental one, is a reduction in immigration. You know, people don't move from Japan to the United States anymore, or at least not very many people do. Uh, in the typical year nowadays, about five to 10,000 uh, people migrate from Japan to the United States. Now, you might think that five or 10,000 is a lot of people, but it's not. <laughs> you know, it's a drop in the bucket. It's not, I mean, in a population of 300 million, you know, you won't even notice 5,000 or 10,000 people. Uh, in contrast, uh, in the typical year, you have something like 70,000 people move from China to the U.S., 70,000 from India, uh, 60,000 from the Philippines. You know, so all these other groups, you know, have large in-migration. Uh, the Japanese do not. Of all the biggest Asian ethnic groups in the United States, uh, the Japanese are the only one whose members were born mostly in the United States. Uh, something like 70% of Japanese Americans were born here in the country, whereas for most groups it's less than 50%. All right, so not too much migration happening anymore. A second reason for the decline of population is an extraordinarily low birth rate. Uh, Japanese American women are not <laughs> having kids, or at least not very many. The uh, average uh, Japanese American woman in her lifetime has 1.1 children, uh, which means that out of 10 women, you'll have a total of 11 children. Um, that's not enough <laughs> because, you know, you start out with two people, a man and a woman. I don't know if I have to explain this to you. Uh, uh, <laughs> didn't you take sex education when you were in fourth grade or something? Uh, but anyhow, you have a man and a woman, two people, and they get together and they have a baby, all right? But if the two people only have, on average, one and a tenth babies, you've got a problem. You know, over time, you know, uh, uh, the population is going to get smaller and smaller. Uh, a third cause of the decline of Japanese America is intermarriage. You know, the first couple of generations, they mostly married other Japanese Americans. Uh, but by the time you get to the third and fourth and fifth generation, uh, there's a lot more racial mixture. You know, uh, you'll have them marrying whites, blacks, Hispanics, all other Asians, non non-Japanese, whatever. Uh, so each time you marry outside the group, you marry somebody who's Japanese, then from a biological or genetic standpoint, you know, the offspring are you know, <laughs> only 50% of you know, what the previous generation had been. So you get, you know, instead of pure Japanese, you get 50% and then 25 and 12 and a half and so forth. All right. Uh, and finally, we have acculturation. Uh, meaning that, you know, even the pure-blooded Japanese aren't acting <laughs> very Japanese. They're Americanizing. You know, they're acting like everybody else in the United States. Uh, uh, I am kind of an example of this. I'll tell you one little pathetic story. <laughs> I have a lot of pathetic stories. But, you know, after I retired, the first thing I did is I wrote this book. And it was kind of... A memoir, and not, his, not history, not scholarly or anything. It was a memoir about my life, my experiences, stuff like that. And then I tried to get it published. So um, I heard about this press, university press, that had a series in Asian American studies, you know. And I figured, I'm Asian American, you know, and I've written this book about my life, my experience and stuff. So, you know, it should fit perfectly, you know, with the series published by this press. So I sent it to them. 
and they got a couple of readers to evaluate it, uh, and they sent it back, and they said, no, <laughs> no, we don't want it. And, and, but they ex and explained why, you know, uh, why they rejected it. And there are two reasons. First, they said, it was boring. <laughs> boring. Okay. Okay. All right. That's so. What else you got? You know. Okay. What's the other reason? You know. Uh, and the other reason was they said it wasn't sufficiently Japanese. You know that that you know I didn't talk all that much about being Japanese and 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 most of my friends are white. You know. And and I said, well, I admit. I confess it's true, you know, most of my friends are white, and in fact, ever since I got married, most of my relatives are white. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the point is that, you know, that uh, my life is not, you know, principally shaped and determined by the fact that I happen to have Japanese ancestors. You know, I'm, it's an important fact, it makes a difference, but it's not like the crucial important fact of my life, you know, it's not what my life is all about. And so when I write this book, I'm talking about all kinds of stuff, one of which is my Japanese heritage. You know? uh, but anyhow, for this particular series, they didn't want just one chapter <laughs> you know, to be about Japanese stuff. They wanted the whole book to be about Japanese stuff. And, and I, you know, I, I didn't argue with them, but you know, I was thinking, yeah, but that's the point, you know, that, that people of my generation are not very Japanese, you know, and most of our friends are white or black or Hispanic or something, you know, and, and the fact of mixing in, assimilating, acculturating, this is the message, you know, that, that my book is showing. But, you know, they didn't want to hear it. Uh, uh, but anyhow, so this acculturation, this Americanization, this, you know, becoming like other Americans, that's another reason why uh, the Japanese are disappearing. Now, we will not go away entirely. You know, there still are a few immigrants coming into the country. Uh, however, we're getting harder and harder to find. You know, there, there aren't very many of us. And, <laughs> you know, take a good look, because a few years from now, we'll be all gone. In order to help you remember us, in order to help you find us, I brought a little prop here. Uh, <coughs> okay, I, I hope I get this on correctly. All right, um, one thing you'll notice right away about me, I'm shameless, you know. <laughs> I'll do anything for a laugh, you know. But, all right, uh, let me tell you about this little headband I've got on here. I hope you can read it. It says San Francisco 49ers. I bought this in San Francisco uh, in 1985 on the day after Super Bowl 19. Now, you're probably not old enough to remember Super Bowl 19, but that was the day the 49ers killed the Miami Dolphins uh, and became uh, the champions of the NFL. And so I was in the city for the celebration and everything. So the next day, I run off to Japantown, uh, which is the Japanese neighborhood in San Francisco, and I buy this thing, you know, as a souvenir of the great victory of the 49ers. Um, this little tool here, though, I hope will be useful in terms of illustrating one of the themes of this lecture, which is acculturation. You know, you start out with a Japanese thing, this headband. You know, if you go to a Japanese restaurant, go to a sushi bar or something, you know, the guy behind the counter chopping up the fish and stuff, he's wearing one of these things, except his doesn't say San Francisco 49ers, you know, so obviously something has changed here. It's been kind of Americanized football, you know, what could be more American than that? Uh, uh, and so this, 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 piece of clothing uh, illustrates, you know, how an artifact that comes from Japan is being modified to kind of fit into the American situation. All right, so let's go. Uh, in order to understand Japanese American history, you have to know how to count, all right? You have to count, and you have to count in Japanese. I was talking with this gentleman at the beginning of class about this. What I want to do now is to teach you how to count to five, <laughs> okay? I hope that's not asking too much. Uh, one is ichi. All right, repeat after me. Ichi. 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 Okay, very good. Now, ichi is a word you see all over the place, including right up here. I don't know if you can see it, but it says ichiban. Uh, uh, ichiban means number one, means the best, you know? So after winning the Super Bowl, uh, the 49ers are ichiban, they're number one. 
you uh, run into that word in the paper today. I was reading in the Standard Times sports section uh, a little article about Ichiro Suzuki. You know, Ichiro who plays for the Yankees now. Uh, Ichiro, the name means first boy or first son. Uh, what's interesting about him is that he has an older brother. <laughs> And, and I don't know why his parents named him Ichiro, but if I was his older brother, I'd be pissed, you know? <laughs> I mean, what am I, chop sushi or something? You know, uh, uh, but I don't know, Japanese do weird things. All right, so you got Ichiro, Ichiban, Ichi is one. Ni. Ni. San. San. She. She. Go. Go. Enough. You're good. Okay. All right. Let's take it from the top. Ichi ni san shi go. Okay. All right. Congratulations. You know, now know how to count to five, which means that you know exactly half as much Japanese as I do. Yeah. Uh, now these five words are the roots of the words that are used to name the first five generations of Japanese to live in the United States. Uh, if you look at that little handout I gave you, my family tree there, along the left edge uh, you can see the names of those five generations uh, uh, starting with the Issei. The first generation is the Issei. Uh, so already I've thrown you a curveball. <laughs> you know, it should be Ichisei or something, but it's, it's just Issei. You just take that first syllable. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they're the immigrants. They're the ones who came from Japan. They are my grandparents. Almost none of these people ever became citizens. Uh, it's not so much because they didn't want to become citizens. Uh, it's because they couldn't. It was against the law. Way back when the country was young, in 1790, in you know, the first session of Congress, Congress passed a law which said that naturalization was limited to white people. You know, so uh, if you were an American Indian coming from, you know, Brazil or something, uh, or if you were an African coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, whatever, you could not become uh, a citizen of the United States. You know, it was a white man's country. And they wanted to keep it that way, so you know we, we discourage uh, immigrants and immigration by not allowing them, uh, not allowing the immigrants themselves to become citizens. That law from 1790 was not changed until 1952. All right. So all that time, it was not permitted, you know, for people, you know, coming from any non-white civilization uh, to become citizens of the United States. Therefore, the Issei uh, spent their whole lives as foreigners in America. You know, by the time naturalization was opened up to them, either they were dead or they were so old they just said, screw it, you know. <laughs> I'm 75 years old, I don't want to take a test, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, so very few Issei uh, ever became citizens. The second generation are the Nisei, and that is my parents' generation. These people were born in the United States. And because they were born in the United States, they were automatically citizens. They didn't have to get naturalized. Practically all of the Nisei are pure Japanese from a biological standpoint, you know, from genetically and DNA or whatever, they are pure uh, Japanese. Culture, that's because, you know, there was almost no racial mixing, you know, back in those days, in marrying whites or blacks or whatever, very little of that. Culturally, however, uh, the Nisei are pretty Americanized, all right, in terms of their behavior. Uh, they are quite American. Uh, they speak English more than Japanese. Uh, my mother tells a story, for instance, of her childhood. Um, when she was growing up, when she was a little kid, uh, she, you know, she spoke Japanese. So when she was talking to her parents, her brothers and sisters, you know, they talked in Japanese. But then she started school. I think she was six or something. Uh, and once she started school, her father forbade her to speak anything but English. You know, so that henceforth in the house, in the school, in the neighborhood, playing with kids, whatever, no more Japanese. You can talk only English. 
because uh, he wanted his kids to be American, you know, not Japanese, not kind of ambiguous <laughs> or whatever. Uh, uh, so she didn't speak any Japanese after the age of six. Uh, and as a result, she pretty much forgot it. You know, she knows a little bit. She, if somebody speaks it to her, she can understand a little bit. But she can't talk it at all. And because she can't talk it, you know, I never heard it, you know, and so, so I never learned it or whatever. Uh, but anyhow, her generation, you know, uh, were discouraged from uh, speaking Japanese uh, and encouraged only uh, to speak English. And so that's, you know, again, a, a way in which they were Americanized. The third generation are the Sansei. That's my generation. And once again, I have a prop for that. Uh, <laughs> This is a t-shirt uh, I got. I don't know if you can read it. It says, Sons, Sansei, the sushi bar. It's from uh, Maui. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, but uh, when I was, my wife and I were there about 15 years ago or something, uh, I, saw, you know, I saw this restaurant. I said, oh, I got to get the, that t-shirt, you know, because I'm a Sansei. You know? So all right, the Sansei. Well, we are highly Americanized. Uh, hardly any Sansei speak Japanese. You know, the language has pretty much died out uh, in our generation. This gets us to the fourth generation. And, you know, if, pre if the Issei gave you a curveball, the, the fourth generation is a knuckleball. <laughs> I mean, this really will freak you out. Here we go. All right, now you've learned to count to four. You know that she means four. So you would expect that the fourth generation would be called the shisei. That's logical, right? Well, Japanese not logical. She is what is called a homophone. I think I have that word on the, the list of uh, vocabulary there. A homophone is a word that sounds exactly the same as a totally different word. So that in English, for example, uh, bear is a homophone. You know, you can have Smokey the Bear, uh, and you can have Bare Naked Ladies, you know, the group that sings uh, the, the uh, theme song for the Big Bang Theory. Uh, but those two bears are very different kinds of bears. You know, they're spelled differently, they mean something different, but they sound exactly the same. Okay, so that's what a homophone is. Well, in Japanese, she, the sound, can mean several different things depending on the context. If you're counting, you know, ichi, ni, san, shi, then it means four. But in different contexts, she can mean poem, it can mean city, it can mean death. <laughs> death. Okay, and this is the problem. You know, you don't want to have anything to do with death. You don't want to say the word death. You don't want to, you know, do anything associated with death. You want to avoid death whenever possible. So the Japanese avoid it. Four is an unlucky number and you do everything you can to avoid four. So for instance, you know, if you want to buy a set of teacups made in Japan, you know, you get a pot and a set of teacups. Uh, it'll have five cups, you know, they'll never have four cups because that would be unlucky, you know, so anything to do with four you, you try to avoid. So that means when you're talking, uh, you, you can't sh say she say because that would be like the generation of death, <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't sound too good, so you got to avoid that word. And therefore the Japanese have an alternative word for four, they have a different word for four, uh, and that is yon. And that doesn't sound like death. It doesn't sound like anything too terribly bad, you know. So, so that is something that uh, uh, that we can make use of. By the way, the Chinese have the same thing. In, in Chinese, also four is an unlucky number. Uh, now, if I had kids, my kids would be Yonsei, you know, fourth generation. As it happens, I don't. Uh, but my sister does. She has two boys, two sons, uh, and therefore they are Yonsei. But they are not entirely Japanese. My sister married a Caucasian, an Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, uh, and her boys don't seem very Jap <laughs> Japanese. They don't look Japanese. Uh, uh, one of them, the younger son, actually kind of looks Mexican <laughs> or something. Uh, they grew up in California, and, and uh, uh, my, you know, my nephews 
pals when he was growing up. Some of them uh, would joke around. They called him Poncho. <laughs> you know, I don't think he liked that very much. Uh, uh, but anyhow, he doesn't look Japanese at all, you know, um, and neither does the other one. They don't act Japanese. They don't think of themselves as Japanese or Asian. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes you have to fill out forms, you know, and they ask you what your race is, and you put a little check mark and whatever. And, uh, you know, so you can say white or American Indian or Pacific Islander or whatever. Uh, they don't answer Asian or white. Uh, either they say none of the above, uh, or they just leave it blank and, you know, refuse to answer it or whatever but they don't want to be kind of pigeonholed uh, into any racial category. Jan's, my sister's older son, got married a few years ago, uh, but the woman he married uh, was neither white nor Japanese nor black nor any of the above. Uh, he married an immigrant from Cambodia. Uh, he married a Cambodian woman. Um, and as a result, their family is more Cambodian than Japanese. You know, when they sit down to dinner, if they're not eating American food, it's probably going to be Cambodian food. <laughs> the only time they get Japanese food is if they go to a restaurant or something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, so anyhow, again, you, know, you see kind of the, the loss of any kind of Japanese heritage. Now they have a daughter, a little three-year-old girl, very cute. Uh, technically, this girl is a fifth generation Japanese American, so she would qualify as a gose. However, if there's one thing in this world I'm sure of, it's that this little girl will never call herself a gose. <laughs> She'll never learn the word, you know. It has no meaning to her. Uh, biologically, she is one quarter Japanese, you know, so that's enough to make her a gose. But cultural, culturally, she is not Japanese at all, you know. She has nothing to do with Japanese uh, or Japan or whatever. All right. So this then is why Japanese Americans are becoming hard to find. You know, they're just kind of disappearing, mixing in, uh, whatever. And this at last gets us to point two, America. The first Asians to come to the United States in large numbers were the Chinese. Right? The Chinese come here first. They joined in the gold rush, the California gold rush, after the discovery of gold in 1849. And once again, this headband is relevant. Uh, the 49ers, that's how they got their name, is in 1849, gold was found in California. Uh, and, you know, thousands and thousands of people rushed to California from all over the world, uh, including from China. Uh, the Chinese called America Gold Mountain, you know, indicating not just the you know, simple fact of gold, but also wealth and prosperity and opportunity in general. Uh, they went looking not only for gold, uh, but also later for all kinds of other metals, silver, copper, whatever, in any place you had a, uh, you know, some valuable strike of minerals, you know, the Jap uh, Chinese would head out there as miners uh, trying to cash in on that. Uh, in the coming decades, the 1860s and 1870s, more Chinese came to America to build the railroads. This was the great age of the transcontinental railroads, you know, building railroads from one coast to the, the other. And, you know, that's hard, dangerous, poorly paid labor. Who wants to do it? We do, yeah. <laughs> because for us, it seems pretty good. You know, it's better money than we're making in China, you know. Uh, so, so, you know, thousands and thousands of Chinese come out uh, to America to build the railroads. When they come to America, the railroad companies say, hey, welcome, you know, we like to have you here. Uh, but other Americans are not so enthusiastic, you know. They, they don't like having all these Chinese come into the country. Uh, partly it's just racial prejudice, you know, you're non-white, and we, this is a white man's country, and we don't want you here. Uh, but also partly it's economic uh, that working people did not appreciate low-wage competition. You know, the unions, you know, there weren't very many in the 1870s, but such as they were, unions said, hey, these immigrants are killing us, you know, they work for nothing, uh, they don't complain about bad treatment or whether, how can a white man ever get a good job uh, when all these Chinese guys will do anything for nothing, or practically nothing. Uh, so anyhow, lots of people then, for different reasons, are hostile to these Chinese immigrants. Congress uh, reacts to public opinion. 
1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. Okay, so you, know, we don't, you don't like the Chinese, uh, we'll solve that problem by banning them. We will not allow Chinese to come to America uh, anymore. So after the passage of this law in 1882, uh, the flow of immigration from China pretty much dries up. You know, there's a few who get in somehow, uh, but not very many uh, after 1882. Well, that's bad for the Chinese, it's good for the Japanese, because <laughs> that means this little niche has kind of opened up. You know, the Chinese can't come in anymore, uh, so how about us instead? It's after 1882 then, and especially in the 1890s, uh, that you start getting large numbers of Japanese taking the place of the Chinese uh, and coming to America. So that's when we get the Issei, uh, starting in the 80s and 90s. Turns out, however, <laughs> Americans don't like the Chi uh, Japanese any better than they did the Chinese, and so we're gonna have history kind of repeating itself a few decades later. In 1907, Congress banned Japanese immigration to the U.S., all right? So first, we keep out the Chinese, and now we're gonna keep out the Japanese. However, Japan had a little more weight in international affairs than China did, and so the U.S. had to make some concessions to, to mollify the Japanese nation so that they didn't become too hostile, uh, and therefore uh, this legislation of 1907 had some loopholes built in, you know, to make it a little easier for the Japanese than it had been for the Chinese. There were two big loopholes in particular. The first loophole was named Hawaii. <laughs> okay. You can't go to California or Washington or Oregon, but you can go to Hawaii. That's because in 1907, Hawaii was not a state. You know, it's just a territory. All right, so we don't care who goes to some territory. That's you know, the frontier out there. You know, uh, so, so the Japanese were allowed to come to the islands there uh, in the middle of the ocean instead of coming all the way to the mainland. And they did, very large numbers. See, the Hawaiians, uh, you know, they were growing pineapples and sugar and stuff like that. Uh, they had been hiring cheap Chinese labor, but now that was cut off, so now they switched to cheap Japanese labor. All right, so, so you know, thousands and thousands of Japanese migrate to Hawaii. In a few years, more than a third of the population of Hawaii was Japanese, all right? So they become a very, very large uh, sector of the population in the Hawaiian Islands. All right, so Hawaii is the first loophole. The second loophole is marriage. A Japanese could come to America in order to join a spouse. Now when I say spouse, what I mean is 99% of the time is a husband. You know, what'll happen is that men, large numbers of men, came to America first, and then years later, you know, <laughs> they would get a wife uh, to come join them uh, from Japan. Uh, and this is how both of my grandmothers got to America. They came after 1907, uh, but because their husband was already here, they were grandmother did or something, you know, they, they, they could sneak in uh, because uh, their husband was here. All right, so these were the conditions, rather inhospitable conditions, under which my ancestors came to the United States. So now let me introduce them, uh, and you can look at that little family tree if you want to see how their names are spelled. My father's father was named Kohei Hijia, or Hijia, or we pronounce it all different ways. <laughs> I don't care how you pronounce it. Uh, 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 Americans called him Frank, all right? Yeah, to make it simple. My mother's father was named Keiichi Fukai, and there's that word Ichi again. Uh, in this case, Keiichi means respectful first son, all right? So his, you know, that Ichi indicates his position in the family. Americans called him George. Uh, in, in, in that, those first two generations of, of Japanese Americans, you're going to have thousands, tens of thousands of Georges, you know, because uh, George Washington, whatever. Uh, you know who's the most famous George in the Nisei generation? Uh, generation? 
George Takei. Anybody oh, know who yeah. George Takei is? Yeah. <laughs> Lieutenant Sulu from the original Star Wars. You know, uh, he's a Nisei. Uh, Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek. Star Trek. Right. Right. Uh, you see him on the Big Bang because you know the, the the guys and the nerds on Big Bang are Trekkies, of course. You know, so so George Takei makes guest appearances. You know, on that show. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, the last name Fukai. Work on the pronunciation. Make sure you make it a long U. <laughs> it causes problems if you make that a short U. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> all four of my grandparents came from a place called Okayama Prefecture. A prefecture is a province, you know, a subdivision of the nation. Okayama is the prefecture right next to Hiroshima Prefecture. Now, I'm told that some of you have read John, how many of you have read John Hersey's book, Hiroshima? Okay, that was, I think, one of three choices you had for, for this course. Uh, you probably don't remember this, uh, but there was a Mr. Fukai uh, in your book. Uh, this was in Hiroshima right after the bomb was dropped. You know, boom, uh, the city is going up in flames. Uh, and Mr. Fukai is one of the lucky ones. He escapes. He's running out of the city. He's going down the road. Uh, but then he turns around and he looks back and he sees Hiroshima, you know, it's all smoke and flames and destruction. Uh, and he realizes that, you know, his friends are all gone, his work, his house, uh, his, his whole life, you know, it's all gone. Uh, so Mr. Fukai turns around and he runs back into the city. You know, he commits suicide, you know, by running into the flames. Uh, and that is the end of Mr. Fuka. <laughs> now, I don't know if he's any relative, uh, relation to me, probably not. Uh, my family tells me that part of Japan has Fukais all over the place, you know, so, so it's probably not re related. But anyhow, we have the same name. Both of my grandfathers came to the United States around 1900. Uh, that is, they came before the door was slammed shut, when it was still legal, still open. Uh, they, they moved around some, but eventually they both ended up in Portland, Oregon. All right, so my family, as an American family, kind of starts in Portland. At some point, I don't know exactly when, uh, Grandpa Hijia went back to Okayama. All right, he went back for a visit. Uh, and he found himself a bride, all right? Yeah, getting kind of lonely by <laughs> after 10 years or something. Uh, so he goes back to Japan, goes back to his home province of Okayama, and he finds this woman. They get married, uh, and he brings his bride back to Portland, Oregon. They had three children who survived infancy, and I always have to add that, who survived infancy, because people forget that in those days, 100 years ago, a lot of people didn't survive infancy, and a lot of babies died at childbirth, or they died in the next few days or weeks or whatever. And so on both of my grandparents' side, you know, at least one kid died you know, uh, in, in the first year of life. But among the ones who survived, you know, there were three. The last of these three Hijias uh, uh, was my father, whom they named George. So he wasn't just called George, he was actually named officially George. That's what it says on his birth certificate. I do know when my other grandfather, Keiichi Fukai, got married, it was 1912. All right, so this was definitely after uh, the restriction of immigration. But his marriage was kind of interesting. It was an arranged marriage, meaning it was arranged by the parents of the, of the couple. You know, so, uh, you know, in Japan, one family would say, well, we got this son we want to marry off, and another family would say, oh, well, we have this daughter we'd like to marry off, and they'd talk and figure out, you know, whether this is going to work, whether they're suited for one another or stuff, and they agree, okay, um, these two are going to get married. Now, you know, to us, seems kind of weird, you know. We, <laughs> we kind of would like to choose who we're going to spend the rest of our lives with, you know, but 100 years ago in Japan, yeah, it's not really necessary, you know, because your family knows what will work and what's good for you and stuff, so we'll make uh, this decision on your behalf. So they got married, but the funny thing about the wedding, it was in Okayama, but 
the groom wasn't there. He was, he was back in Portland, you know. But you didn't have to be there. You could get married without being anywhere close. You could be on the other side of the ocean, you know, and you could still get married. So they got married by proxy, you know. And so, so the, the bride had this piece of paper saying she's married to this guy over in America. Um, so she gets on a boat, ship, sails out of Yokohama, sails to San Francisco. My uh, grandfather uh, takes a train from Portland down to San Francisco. Uh, he goes to the docks. He meets her uh, you know, at the dock, which must have been kind of an interesting event. You know, hello, wife. Nice to meet you. You know, uh, uh, but so that's that's how they met. Uh, it worked out, you know, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, they, they were married quite a while. They had seven children who survived infancy, and the sixth of these seven children was my mother, Namiko uh, Fukai at the time. All right, so now we got them both settled in Portland. The Hijias and the Fukais did pretty well in Portland. Uh, Grandpa Hijia was a businessman. He first ran a hotel, and then he ran a grocery store. Uh, Grandpa Fukai sold insurance. All right, so they're both doing pretty well in business. Uh, the problem, or at least the main problem, was health. You know, these Issei did not enjoy very good health. Uh, both of my grandmothers died when they were fairly young from tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was one of those big killers back a hundred years ago. Grandpa Fukai died of a stroke uh, when my mother was 12 years old. And thus, my mother was an orphan at the age of 12. Her mother died when she was five, her father died when she was 12, so at the age of 12 she has uh, no parents. Uh, her oldest brother, Bob, Uncle Bob to me, uh, became head of the family when he was 20 years old. I mean, you, you folks are about, many of you are about 20 years old. How would you like to be head of a family with six younger brothers and sisters uh, that you had to raise? You know, so that's, that's the situation uh, that he faced. Uncle Bob went into business. His business was selling vegetables. Um, uh, he started out opening up a stall in the public market, you know, in Portland public market, you know, it was open market, and so they had this little s stand, you know, where they would uh, sell, you know, peas and onions and all kinds of stuff, uh, and all the kids would help out, you know, his younger brothers and sisters would work there. Uh, my mother used to tell these stories about <laughs> peeling green peas, you know. Uh, I think of green peas, they come in a you know, plastic bag in the frozen food section. But, but uh, for her, they came in these pods, and you'd have to break open the pod and get the peas to drop out, and they put them in a bucket. She said, you, do you know how long it takes to fill a bucket with, with peas? Or, or green onions, scallions, as they're called here. Uh, you know, she spent all day, she'd have bushels of green onions, and she'd have to chop, them, you know, chop off the bad parts, and then wash them and bundle them. And sell them to the customers. And she said <laughs> she'd, she'd spend a whole day cleaning onions, you know. By the end of the day, she reeked <laughs> of onions, you know. Uh, and the next day would be a dance at a high school or something. She'd go to the dance smelling of onions. <laughs> and she said, oh, awful. You know, uh, uh, all right, but so anyhow, with the help of her and, you know, the whole family there, uh, they make the, the vegetable stand work. Uh, they are able to save some money, you know, and they take their capital and they buy a store, they open a grocery store, they buy a truck, you know, they make deliveries and all that kind of stuff. Uh, 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 they're doing fine. They're, they're, they're on their way to success. They're entrepreneurs. They're uh, capitalists. Everything is great until Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just been listening to President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, this is the speech he gave on December 8, 1941, when he asked Congress to declare war against Japan. All around the country, Japanese Americans are listening to their radios and reading their newspapers and, you know, hearing the news from friends of theirs. And every single one of them is thinking, 
oh shit <laughs> you know oh boy are we in trouble now you know Ooh, it's gonna be bad because you know these Americans most of them didn't like us very much to begin with and now they're gonna hate us you know and the one there were already some who hated us but now they're all gonna hate us you know uh, they're gonna blame us for what those sons of bitches in Japan did you know it's not our fault we didn't do it you know but we know we know we're gonna take the blame for it uh, uh, and that is pretty much uh, what happened. My Uncle Bob could see that at his grocery store uh, because of boycotts. You know, uh, whites and some other people as well stopped going to the store. They stopped going to any business that was owned by Japanese Americans, you know, because uh, they blamed the Japanese, you know, all the Japanese, you know, for Pearl Harbor. Uh, <coughs> business fell off. My mother tells this one story about a longshoreman. Uh, you know what a longshoreman is? They're the guys down at the docks who load and unload cargoes and stuff. Uh, well, he was a regular customer. He and his wife would come every week and they'd buy their grocery at, groceries at my uncle's store. Well, one day, shortly after Pearl Harbor, uh, he comes to the store, but he doesn't get out of the car. You know, he stays in the store. Uh, his wife comes in uh, and she's crying, you know, and she talks to my uncle and my mother uh, and she says, look, I'm sorry, but we won't be able to shop here anymore. Uh, because of the Longshoremen's Union. The Union had forbade its members to patronize you know, a, a Japanese-owned store. So she said, you know, uh, if, you know, if they see us stop shopping in this store, you know, they'll throw him out of the Union, and if he gets thrown out of the Union, he can't get a job, he can't work, you know, so, so I'm sorry, but you know, we have no choice. And um, so she, she bought a ton of stuff, <laughs> you know, since this was her last year, she, she filled the car with groceries uh, uh, and then they drove away and my mother's family never saw them again. All right, so this is the kind of stuff that was happening uh, all around the country. Uncle Bob could read the writing on the wall. He could see where this was going. Uh, so he sold a store. You know, he, he, he could see that you, know, you can't make enough just from Japanese American customers. You, know, you have to sell to whites and blacks and Hispanics and American Indians and everybody. Uh, uh, so he sold a store, he sold a truck. Uh, uh, he went out of business. But that wasn't the worst. The worst was yet to come. In February 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, executive, which is on your sheet there. Uh, this, I don't know if you know what an executive order is. It's sort of like a law, except that Congress doesn't have to pass it. It's something the President kind of does on his own. Uh, and the president could do this on his own because it was a military matter. At least it was called a military matter. It was an or, you know, the president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, so he can tell the army what to do and the military what to do. Uh, and what President Roosevelt did in Executive Order 9066 was to give the army permission to round up the Japanese and put them in jail, basically. It, you know, it didn't say it in so many words, but that was uh, the effect of this executive order. The roundups began in March of 1942 and finished in June. It wasn't just, you know, one day or something like that. It was spread out over a couple of months. This uh, expulsion of the Japanese happened mostly right along the Pacific coast. You know, it was uh, the western third or so of the states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. You know, that's where the Japanese population was concentrated and that's where uh, Executive Order 9066 had its effect. Very interesting, though, interestingly, though, uh, it did not happen in Hawaii, which is where about half of all the Japanese Americans lived, was in Hawaii. Uh, so why didn't it happen in Hawaii? Why didn't they get round up and put in jail? Well, it wasn't practical <laughs> to damn many of them out there. You know, uh, uh, it would cost a fortune to put them all on ships and send them to Montana or something to put them in prison. Uh, plus, you know, that's a third of the population. You can't just take a third of the population out of an area. You know, because all the clerks and factory workers and bus drivers, teachers, low-level government officials, all those people are Japanese Americans. You can't just take them all and, and move them away. So Hawaii, where there was the most, you know, concentrated population population of Japanese is where you did not have uh, uh, a removal. Um, 
Therefore, it was only the Japanese from the mainland who were sent to camp. And that's the word that was used, camp. You know? <laughs> I always thought that was kind of funny because when I was growing up, camp, you know, that was like Boy Scout camp. Like, camp is neat, you know, but not this kind of camp. <laughs> you know, this kind of camp was not quite so good. There were about 110,000 of them. You know, the, you, in different books you read different, some places it says 120, but yeah, somewhere 110, 120,000 uh, were rounded up and taken from their homes and sent to camp. And this included the Hegeas and the Fukais of Portland, Oregon. Why did they do it? Well, the official, the official rationale for Executive Order 9066 was national security. All right, why are you doing this? Well, we're doing this to make the country safe. That's what the government said. The fear was that Japanese Americans might be loyal to the old country instead of the new one. You know, they might be more Japanese than Americans. Uh, they might engage in espionage, spying. Uh, they might engage in sabotage. They might, you know, blow up ships or bridges or trains or something like that. You know, uh, uh, and so we can't afford to have them along the Pacific coast there because there's so many <laughs> ships and water, and that's the launching point for the war against Japan and stuff. You know, uh, uh, they are a threat to our security uh, if they stay where they are. Now people said this, that the Japanese Americans were dangerous, even though two-thirds of those Japanese Americans were Nisei. In other words, they were people born and raised in the United States, citizens of the United States, uh, and yet, uh, according to the official story, uh, they were so dangerous you know, that we have to round them up and put them in jail. Uh, there was an army general who was in charge of the evacuation of the West Coast, and he has kind of a famous quotation. Uh, for him, it was very simple. <laughs> he said, a Jap's a Jap. Okay, a Jap's a Jap. Uh, uh, meaning that, you know, if, if you are of Japanese ancestry, then you're going to stay loyal to Japan, and it doesn't matter if you were born in the U.S., it doesn't matter how long you've been here, it doesn't matter, you know, what language you speak or anything, you know, a Jap's a Jap. Uh, he did not say a Kraut's a Kraut or a Wop's a Wop. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, if you're a German immigrant, well, you can, you know, become a good, loyal American citizen. If you're an Italian immigrant, you can become a good, loyal American American citizen. Uh, uh, if you're white, basically, <laughs> you can become a good, loyal American citizen. But if you're Asian, you know, if you're Japanese, then, you know, we can't trust you, you know, because you people are, you know, not trustworthy. You're treacherous, you know, by nature. And, and it, it lasts forever, generation after generation. All right. So the Italian, you know, and, and the U.S., of course, was at war with Italy and Germany as well as Japan. But, but, you're not going to take Joe DiMaggio <laughs> and put him in jail, even if you're a Red Sox fan. Uh, but you know, you may know Joe DiMaggio. He you know, was center field. He was playing center field for the Yankees. You know, but his parents came from Italy. You know, so if the same rule had been applied to him that was applied to the Japanese, he would be sent off to prison camp. You know, but of course, that's not going to happen. Um, national security was the ostensible reason for expelling the Japanese, but I don't think it was the real one, or at least not the main one. The top leaders of the U.S. government, in the executive branch, in the military, the top guys knew that the Japanese Americans were not actually a threat. And let me tell you how they knew. Before the war, the FBI compiled a list of about 2,000 Japanese Americans whom they thought might be dangerous in case a war broke out. Actually, they, you know, they did this not just for the Japanese, but also for the Germans and Italians. You know, FBI is always making lists. You know? I'm sure they have all kinds of lists right now. I might be on one. I don't know. Uh, uh, but anyhow, so they had this list of you know, who, who could cause trouble for us if we go to war against Japan. Um, once the war broke out, the FBI took their list and went out and arrested all those people. You know, so altogether about four or five thousand Germans, Italians, and Japanese, uh, you know, were were rounded up and and put in jail. Um, I want to focus though on the Japanese. So who were these people that the feds arrested uh, and put in prison? 
Uh, well, for example, they were people who had expressed pro-Japanese or pro-German opinions. You know, if you had written a letter to the editor or given a speech or something like that in which you said, Japan and Germany will rule the world, <laughs> uh, then you're in trouble, okay? <laughs> you know, they, they put your name on a list, you know, and, and the FBI is coming for you. Or uh, people who did business with Japan. You know, if you were a businessman and, and you were involved in international trade, importing and exporting. You know, if, if you traveled to Japan uh, or if Japanese salesmen came to your company and, you know, uh, uh, did deals with you or something like that, uh, well, we don't trust you because how do we know that's just a salesman? How do, how do we know it's not actually a Japanese spy or something like that? You know, so if you have a lot of contact and dealings with Japanese, then you are going to be suspected. Uh, people who led Japanese American organizations. You know, if you if you're you know the president of a fraternal organization, uh, if you're the leader of a church. You know, uh, the, you know the Japanese when they came to America, they would start Shinto churches, Buddhist churches. Shinto is the national religion of Japan. Buddhism, I think you know what that is. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyhow, so a lot of Japanese were either Shintoists or Buddhists. Uh, well, anyhow, their priests were rounded up and put in jail, you know, because those priests, you know, might be leading them uh, to be loyal to Japan instead of loyal to the United States. So in short, then, anybody who had an especially close relationship uh, to Japan, you know, either business or religion or, you know, politics or whatever, anybody who was kind of tight with the Japanese, uh, these people uh, got arrested right away. You know, in December of 41, January of 42, and they were rushed off to prison. Well, the point is that they were already in jail before Executive Order 9066 was issued. The Roosevelt administration, after rounding up these 2,000 Japanese, wanted to know how dangerous the remaining Japanese Americans were. Okay, we got the, the ringleaders, we got the, uh, the most dangerous people, but how about the rest? Therefore, the administration ordered two studies. One was by the FBI, uh, and the other was by the Office of Naval Intelligence. You don't hear that term too often, the ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence. That's the intelligence branch of the Navy. And of course, the Navy was very interested in this because you know the Navy is fighting most of the war against the Japanese it's out there in the Pacific, so they want to make sure there aren't saboteurs and spies and stuff spying on their ships and their fleet and their movements and stuff like that. All right, so the FBI and the ONI both investigate the remaining Japanese. They give their reports to the president, and both reports say, nothing to worry about, no problem. They're not a threat, they're not dangerous. Uh, the potentially dangerous ones are all in jail already. Uh, the ones who are still out there are, are not a threat. You know, either they are loyal to the United States, or even if they have kind of dubious loyalty, they, they are intimidated. You know, they, they wouldn't try anything because they know they couldn't get away with it. I mean, that's the thing. You know, if you're a German American or an Italian American, you look just like 99% <laughs> of the Americans. You can go anywhere and do anything. But if you're Japanese, you stand out like a sore thumb. They can see you. You know, if you're a Japanese and you take your little camera and you're taking pictures of battleships or something like that, they're going to hammer you, they're going to see you, they're going to know you're up to no good, and they're going to nail you. you know? So, uh, for both reasons, either because you are a loyal citizen of the United States, or because you know you could never get away with it, uh, one way or the other, you know, th that 110,000 Japanese are not going to cause trouble. So th both of these studies concluded uh, that there's no danger, there's no need to put these in prison. And yet, they got put in prison anyway. So it makes you wonder why. <laughs> uh, basically, it's because of racial prejudice. Uh, the vast majority of Americans disliked the Japanese and wanted to get rid of them. You know, so that uh, you know uh, this animosity toward the Japanese, I think, is the fundamental reason. In addition, however, there were economic motives. There's money to be made from this process. By 1942, the Japanese were pros uh, prospering. You know, like my, um, you know, Fukai and Hijia relatives in Portland, small businesses are growing, developing. Most Japanese Americans were not businessmen, they were farmers. 
All right, so they go into truck farming. You know, truck farming, vegetable farming uh, is a big business for the Japanese. Japanese Americans owned half the vegetable farms in California. You know, think about that. There's a lot of vegetable farms in California, even back in 1942. Half of them are owned by Japanese, and they're doing very well. You know, they're, they're being very productive farmers, making money. Well, all these white guys say, you know, if we can get rid of them, <laughs> if we can ship them off, then we could move in. We could take over their farms, take over their business. Uh, uh, this is going to mean a lot more opportunity for us. All right, so, the, so there is this big demand then, partly out of sheer racial prejudice, but also partly of, out of this desire to make some money off of this thing. There is this demand among the American population to get rid of the Japanese. Politicians, you probably have discovered, usually do what they think the public wants. <laughs> you know, if they can detect this mass movement, this big opinion switch here against the Japanese, then that's what they're going to follow. In Washington, D.C., the top politician was Franklin Roosevelt. In California, the top politician was a man by the name of Earl Warren. Now you have probably heard the name Earl Warren, and you may know that Earl Warren was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 1954 when it ruled that racial segregation uh, was unconstitutional. Uh, so, you know, most Americans, well, at least most liberal Americans nowadays have a pretty good opinion of Earl Warren. Well, in 1942, though, Earl Warren was not on, su on the Supreme Court. He was Attorney General of California, and he was running for governor. Okay, well, people who are running for governor will do all kinds of things. Uh, he needed to do something that would get him some votes, and one thing that would do that is to lead the campaign to expel the Japanese, all right, because the vast majority of Californians wanted to get rid of the Japanese, so, you know, it's going to be a very popular thing to do. As Attorney General, he held hearings. You know, he invited all these people to come in and testify, and then uh, he wrote up reports. You know, uh, as a result of these hearings, and in these reports, he claimed that the Japanese Americans were a menace. All right, they were dangerous to the state of California and the United States of America. He called for their removal. Okay, we got to get rid of these people because they are such a threat. Now, if you look at the partisan alignment here, Franklin Roosevelt was a Democrat, Earl Warren was a Republican, you know, and they pretty much represented the two major parties. No prominent leader of either major party criticized the incarceration of the Japanese Americans. You know, you don't find big shots, you know, coming out saying, hey, this is wrong, this is unfair, this is unconstitutional. They they might believe that, some of them, but they don't say so. They keep their mouth shut. The only nationally known politician who denounced the removal of the Japanese was Norman Thomas. Uh, Norman Thomas, you've probably not heard of. He was the leader of the Socialist Party. Uh, he was the Socialist nominee for president six times, 1928, 32, 36, 40, 44, 48. You know, a perennial nominee of the Socialist Party for president. All six times he lost. <laughs> in fact, he didn't even come close. You know. Uh, let me give you some advice. If you're ever in a fight, you know, uh, and you've got the socialists on your side, and you've got the Democrats and the Republicans against you, you better start running. <laughs> you know, because you don't have a chance. You know. Uh, and, and so the Japanese had the Socialist Party, you know advocating for them, but that's not going to be enough uh, when the Democrats and the Republicans agree that they want to get rid of you. All right, so the removal took place. Japanese Americans had to sell their businesses, sell their houses, and of course when they did that they could not get a very good price. You know, because when the buyer knows that you have no choice, you have to leave, you know, in six days or something like that. You can't negotiate, you can't wait for a better, you know, for the market to go up or something like that. You have to sell for you know, whatever price anybody is offering you. So uh, people sold for pennies on the dollar. Now, when all this was happening, my mother was a senior in high school. Uh, um, that's when her family got the order they had to leave Portland. But just before she 
was forced to drop out of high school, she had kind of an interesting experience in English class. Uh, her English teacher was a woman named Winifred C. Hayes. I put her name on that little handout I gave you. Uh, Mrs. Hayes didn't follow the lesson plan. <laughs> One day in class, you know, instead of talking about grammar and, and prose composition and metaphors and symbols and stuff like that, uh, she dev devoted the entire class to talking about the uh, removal of the Japanese. Yeah, because, you know, some of those people in her class were Japanese Americans and she was saying, you know, look around, you know, these kids out there, they're going to be gone in a few days. You know, they're going to be taken out of school and they're going to be put in prison, you know. And think about that. Think about uh, what is happening. And Mrs. Hayes uh, kept saying this is unconstitutional and this is against the Constitution. I mean, for the government to put somebody in jail, they have to charge them with something. You know, if you're in prison, you should be, you know, accused and put on trial and convicted. Okay, if that happens, then they can take you to jail. But for the Japanese, they certainly haven't been put on trial, but they haven't even been accused. You know, there are no charges being brought against them. No one is saying that they violated this law or that. Their only crime is that they have ancestors who lived in Japan. You know, uh, and so Mrs. Hayes, you know, uh, spent the whole hour talking about that. Now, I don't know if she got in trouble for that. I mean, because, you know, it's probably a violation of professional ethics to talk about current events and politics and stuff like that instead of talking about grammar and prose composition. But I'm kind of glad she did it, you know, because it's kind of nice to look back and think that somebody spoke up, you know, when, when Earl Warren and Franklin Roosevelt and all these other guys were either doing bad things or keeping their mouths shut. It's kind of nice that somebody says, hey, this is wrong, you know. Uh, uh, and so after all all these years, I still remember that. All right, well, I'm running a little behind time. I'm gonna to try to speed things up a little bit here. I'll skip a few things. Let's get to point three, relocation. When the Japanese in Portland got evicted from their homes, they were sent first to a temporary camp called the Portland Assembly Center. The Portland Assembly Center. That was a new name for it. It was previously called the Pacific International Livestock Exhibition Pavilion. Uh, in other words, the stockyards. All right? So your new home used to be the home for cattle and horses, uh, and now it's where you will live. Uh, each family lived in a stall, uh, and there wasn't very much privacy. You know, if you've ever seen a horse stall, I mean, the walls are only about this high or something like that. So my mother says, you know, you can hear everything going on in all the other stalls all around, you know. Uh, uh, plus, she said it didn't stink too well. I mean, it didn't smell too good, you know, all these horses and stuff around. Um, it wasn't very sanitary. Uh, dysentery. You know, went running through the camp, you know, disease, you know, in, in circumstances like that. You can understand how disease would go uh, rampant. Uh, my mother got sick, real sick, and her sister thought she was going to die or something. Uh, it turned out she just had the flu, but, you know, still it's kind of scary. Uh, my Uncle Bob decided we got to get out of here, you know. This, this place is too awful, too dangerous. We got, we got to get out. Uh, he heard <coughs> that the United States was building a brand new concentration camp in California, you know, uh, and he figured a brand new camp has got to be better than living in a horse stall, you know. Uh, uh, so he volunteered, you know, he said, as soon as that camp is ready, we want to go. Put us on a train. Send us to that new camp as soon as it, it, it gets built. All right. Uh, this camp was called a relocation center, uh, but that is a euphemism. Uh, Euphemism, you know, comes from the Greek. It means good speech. Uh, when you use a euphemism, what you do is you take something bad and, and make it sound good <laughs> by using a misleading term. Well, anyhow, relocation center is misleading. Relocation, you know, that sounds fine. You know, what's wrong with relocation? We all relocate. I mean, 20 years ago, my wife and I relocated from Easton, Massachusetts to Dartmouth, Massachusetts. You know, it's closer to my work and stuff. So re relocation is either good or at least not bad bad, it sounds a lot better than concentration camp, you know, it sounds a lot better than prison, you know, so even though what you're building is a concentration camp, you don't call it that, you call it a relocation center, uh, because that way you can kind of forget uh, what is actually happening there. 
All right, so they're headed toward the relocation center. They get on the train, uh, and the train drops them, uh, takes them down to California. Mom said it was a really weird train ride because the windows were all covered, you know, the, which is kind of a drag. Because you know, when I'm riding in a train or a bus or airplane, or I like to look out the windows, you know, see what's going on. But on her train, all the blinds were shut, you know. So it was not so much so that the they could not see out. It was so because so that people out there could not see in because the army was running this. The army figured if they stop at a station and there are all these white people <laughs> on the platform and they look in and they see all these Japanese, we're going to have a riot or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so we better not let them know who's on the train here. So they, they shuttered all the windows. So they had to ride all the way from uh, Oregon to California with the, the windows covered up. All right, so they go to California uh, in the northeastern corner of California uh, to a place called Tule Lake. Tule Lake, which is on your list there. Tule Lake eventually became the largest of all the concentration camps. All right, it was the biggest camp in the United States. Uh, at its peak, it had almost 19,000 Japanese American prisoners. That's a lot of people uh, in one camp. It had also 1,200 soldiers standing guard over them. I mean, when you have a prison, you have to have jailers, right? So the army gets this job, and there were 1,200 men uh, standing guard over 19,000 Japanese. Now, technically, it wasn't a prison. Uh, it was a relocation center, but it seemed like a prison uh, because the walls all around it were covered with barbed wire. Uh, and then, you know, they had these towers. Uh, and on top of the tower would be a soldier with a Tommy gun, you know, a Thompson submachine gun. Uh, tanks would patrol the perimeter. You know, tanks would roll around the outside making sure that nobody escaped. And they actually, a couple of times there were disturbances, you know, the, the, the prisoners were getting kind of unruly. And so then the tanks would come inside, uh, you know, the, the camp for crowd control, you know. So anyhow, you got guys with machine guns, you got tanks. Uh, it's not a prison, but it kind of seems like one. Yeah. Um, so that's my mother in Tule Lake. Meanwhile, my father had a slightly different experience. Uh, his family did not volunteer to go to Tule Lake. Uh, they tried to stay in Portland as long as they possibly could. You know, they kept holding on to this faint hope that the Americans would change their mind and let us go back to our homes here in Portland. So they, they did not try to go to California. But eventually, they had to leave too. You know, the Portland Assembly Center was closed, uh, and everybody was dispersed somewhere. Uh, so my father and his family got sent to a camp in Idaho. All right, so my mother's family goes to California. My father's family goes to Idaho. They stayed there for a while, a couple of years, uh, but not forever. They eventually got out of the camps. My mother got out by becoming a housemaid. <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you could leave the camp if you had a job in a place that was far enough away from the coast uh, so that the authorities didn't have to worry that you were up to mischief. You know. uh, and Spokane, Washington, which is where my mother went, uh, is about 300 miles from the Pacific Ocean. So you know, it's, far, it's almost on the Idaho border. So it's far enough away that uh, the army figured, you know, well, my mother and her, her sister went with her. They were the upstairs and downstairs maids uh, for this rich woman's house in Spokane, Washington. Um, uh, but anyhow, Spokane was considered remote enough uh, that my mother couldn't you know, blow up ships and send secret coded message to Jap submarines lurking off the coast or whatever. Uh, uh, and so that's why she and her sister uh, were allowed to go uh, to Spokane. The war had a big effect on Spokane. Uh, before the war, there were very few Japanese who lived there, uh, but because it was considered, you know, out of the boondocks and not a dangerous place, you know, for potential spies and saboteurs, hundreds and hundreds of Japanese who had been living on the coast, when they got out of camp, you know, they, they went to Spokane, and Spokane therefore became one of the kind of population centers uh, for Japanese Americans in the United States. All right. So that's how my mom got out of jail. My father got out by volunteering for the army. 
Okay, that's a, that's the way guys can get out of prison is by joining the army. You, if you if you don't like this concentration camp, how about boot camp? All right. Uh, uh, so if you're willing to serve in the military, uh, then we will release you from prison. The percentage of Japanese Americans who served in the U.S. Armed Forces during World War II was higher than it was for any other ethnic group. In other words, more than whites, more than blacks, more than American Indians, more than Hispanic, whatever, uh, uh, an extremely high percentage of Japanese Americans served on the U.S. side <laughs> in the war. Uh, the question that raises is why? I mean, think about it, you know. If your family has been rounded up, taken out of their houses, thrown out of their jobs, and put in jail, why are you going to fight for this country, you know? Uh, why would you fight for people who are doing this uh, to you and your family? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, partly, it was for the same kind of reasons that all other Americans had. Uh, one was simple love of country. I mean, they actually liked it here, <laughs> at least before 1941. Uh, uh, it's the only country they knew, uh, and, you know, like other Americans, they were willing to fight for it. Second reason is one that affects people everywhere all the time who join the military, and that was kind of to prove themselves, you know, to show that you are not a weakling, not a coward, uh, not selfish, you know, you are willing to sacrifice uh, and take risks, and, and you have courage, you have strength, you know, and so you join the army. Uh, and, but again, you know, that reason also is not just Japanese, and it would not affect only Japanese, but you know, whites, blacks, everybody has that kind of motivation. So let's look at the reasons that are peculiar to the Japanese. You know, why would Japanese be more likely, you know, than a white person to join the army? Well, one I've talked about uh, already, that is get out of jail, <laughs> you know, if, if you can escape, you know, escape from the prison camp by joining the army, you say, well, let's join the army. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so that's one motivation for the high rate of volunteering. There's also a final reason, though, and I think it's kind of important. That is, they volunteered in order to prove that Japanese Americans as a group were loyal to the United States. In other words, you Americans think we're traitors or potential traitors. You don't think we can be trusted. Well, we're going to show you otherwise. Uh, by serving in the military and by risking their lives for the country, they thought that this would be rather conclusive proof you know, that they were, in fact, loyal. I get a little worked up about this. I need a drink and water <laughs> won't do it. All right. So finally, let's get to the end here, point four, war, okay? My father was assigned to an outfit called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Uh, and you can find that written in, in your uh, handout there. This outfit was all Japanese. Uh, what that means is that the enlisted men, and I think most of the non-commissioned officers, you know, corporals and sergeants, uh, were Japanese Americans. The officers were white, all right, so the whites are in charge, uh, at least at the beginning. Now, once the unit got into combat, those officers had a kind of discomforting habit of getting killed <laughs> or wounded, you know, so a lot of casualties, and so somebody has to become new officers, uh, so there was a lot of promotion from the ranks, you know, so some guy who started out as a private or a sergeant <laughs> might end up as a lieutenant or a captain, you know, so eventually uh, some of those Japanese Americans did become officers, at least at, you know, kind of the lower levels. Uh, but at the beginning, anyway, it was all white officers and all Japanese enlisted men and non-coms. Now, you might be wondering, what the hell is a regimental combat team? You know, it's not quite the same thing as a regiment. A regimental combat team is an infantry regiment which is augmented by smaller support units. All right? You start with infantry and then you add some other pieces. So it's kind of bigger and more diverse than just infantry. At the core of the 442 were three infantry battalions. All right? So you have you know, 12 companies, three battalions of infantry. One of these battalions was the 100th Battalion. Uh, and this outfit has kind of an in, uh, interesting history, I'll repeat briefly. Uh, they were Hawaiians. You know, the 100th uh, came from Hawaii, and they were the first 
Japanese Americans to serve in the military. You know, when the war broke out, the Hawaiians just rushed uh, into the service. You know, the, as soon as they were you know, for the first year or something, Japanese were not allowed to serve because they weren't trusted. But when the, the government finally said, "Well, I guess we can trust some of you guys," uh, uh, the Hawaiians said, "Take us first. You know, and they they sent out uh, an advertisement saying, "We need a thousand recruits. We need a thousand volunteers for this hundredth battalion that we're forming." They got, I think, eight or nine thousand guys <laughs> show up. You know, all clamoring to be allowed uh, uh, into the army. Um, so anyhow, the 100th Battalion is the oldest part uh, of the 42nd. The Hawaiians are the ones who get into the army first. They go into combat first. Uh, they're, they're the pioneers there. Uh, later, the U.S. formed this bigger group, the 442nd, you know, but they already had this 100th Battalion. So what they did is they took the 100th and they just kind of fused it in. They made it part of the 442nd. Uh, but that kind of <laughs> caused some awkwardness because uh, th they had three battalions, so the logical thing would be to call them the 1st, the 2nd, and the 3rd Battalion. But the 100th Battalion said, no, we like our name. We like to be called the 100th. <laughs> you know? uh, and they wanted to keep their name. You know? uh, so, so that in the 442, you've got the 3rd, the 2nd, and the 100th. You know, you, you, you've got these three uh, battalions. But you know, the, the, the 100th was really proud you know, because they were the first. You know, they were uh, Ichiban. You know? uh, uh, and they wanted to maintain that distinction. All right, so you got these infantry battalions, but you also have support units. You have a field artillery battalion, cannons. You have combat engineers, a company of combat engineers. You know, if you want, if you need to build a bridge or fix a road or something like that, they even had their own band, you know, an army band. You know, uh, 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 so what happens then is the 442nd is a little self-sufficient, self-contained Japanese-American army. You know, <laughs> they got everything they need, kind of all wrapped up in one little package, uh, the 442. <sighs> the 442 got sent to Italy to fight the Germans. It would have been kind of awkward to send them to the Pacific to fight the Japanese. <laughs> I'm not sure the, the government really entirely trusted them that much, but they figured, okay, we know you guys will fight the Germans. So they get sent uh, to Italy where the Germans are occupying. Uh, the 442 fought their way up the Italian peninsula. They participated in the battles of Anzio, Monte Cassino, the liberation of Rome, uh, and then came the Rome Arno campaign, which I've listed on your little handout. I don't know how familiar you are with Italian geography, but the Arno River flows from Florence to Pisa. Um, uh, the 442 was part of the army that drove the Germans out of Florence and Pisa. Now, a few years ago, my wife and I went on vacation in Italy. We went to Florence and took a little day trip to Pisa. So, you know, we got a chance to look at the Arno River, which is very nice and scenic and historic and whatever. And I looked at that river and I thought, you know, 60 years ago, my father was <laughs> around here. He might have been looking at this river. He might have you know, seen the same sights I did, except he didn't see them quite the same way that I did. Uh, for, for me and my wife, you know, our main worry was stuff like, well, how do we find this restaurant? I've got this map, you know, but I'm lost, <laughs> whatever. Uh, his worry was Germans are shooting at me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is kind of a more immediate sort of problem. Uh, uh, so I don't think he had quite as much opportunity to enjoy the scenery, you know, and the cultural uh, uh, richness of, of Italy. Uh, my father never talked about the war and you know like a lot of combat veterans uh, he, he just didn't want to talk about it. My mother says he never said anything to her. Uh, I talked to my aunt, you know my father's sister, uh, and she told me the same thing you know he, he didn't want to talk about the war but there was one story that he did tell her one day they were out, you know, in a battle, and, and it had been going on for a long time. They were all tired, and so the sergeant told him, "Okay, guys, take a rest." You know, so my father and his buddy, his best friend, just kind of collapsed, you know, at the side of the road, and, you know, uh, uh, and got as much sleep as they could. And then this next thing they knew, the sergeant was saying, "Okay, get up, time to go, time to move on." Uh, so my father, he kind of staggers to his feet and you know, puts on his pack and stuff, and his but buddy is still lying there, you know. So she says. Hey, Hey, pal, let's go. Time to move on. You know. And he kind of shakes him, but he doesn't move. So he rolls him over. He's dead. Okay. Uh, 
that's the only story that my dad told about the war. And I can understand why he didn't want to talk about the war, <laughs> you know, because that's kind of what it was all about. All right. Um, after the Arno campaign, the 442nd shipped out for France. Uh, and for my father, World War II ended somewhere in the south of France, the French Riviera. Yeah, that sounds nice, the French Riviera. What a great place to visit. But again, not quite so much fun if people are trying to kill you, you know, at the time. Uh, <clears throat> he took a load of shrapnel in his shoulder. You know, the artillery shell exploded and some of the shrapnel got in his shoulder. And so for the rest of his life, he was partly disabled. Uh, he could raise his arm about this far. My mother says it kind of interfered with his golf swing, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyhow, uh, for him, uh, that was the end of the war. He got mustered out of the service. When he got out, he was, or before he got out, he was given two bronze stars and a purple heart. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with these military medals and stuff. Uh, the bronze star is a medal recognizing either valor or at least meritorious service in combat. In other words, you didn't run away or something, you did your job. Uh, the purple heart is for getting killed or wounded in action. Purple Heart is the oldest uh, you know, medal in the United States military. It goes back to George Washington time. Uh, well, the men in the 442 collected almost 9,500 Purple Hearts. That's a big number uh, when you consider that altogether only 14,000 men served <laughs> in the 442. You know, so you do the arithmetic, 9,500 Purple Hearts out of 14,000 people, uh, that means that about two-thirds of the guys in it got killed or wounded. Uh, uh, an amazingly high percentage. For the U.S. Armed Forces as a whole in World War II, uh, for every 15 people who served, there was one who got a Purple Heart. You know, so the difference is if you join kind of the military and get assigned at random to some uh, unit, your chance is about 7% of getting killed or wounded. You join the 442, your chance is 67%. Okay, <laughs> that, I, I'm not good at math, but I know there's a difference between 7% and 67%. Uh, the 100th Battalion uh, had a nickname, the Purple Heart Battalion, you know, because so many of their people uh, got killed or wounded in combat. The 442 also collected uh, 21 Medals of Honor, and the Congressional Medal of Honor you know, is the highest uh, award for valor. The most famous engagement for the 442 occurred at the Battle of the Bulge in October 1944. I won't go into much military history here, but what happened was that uh, this is in France. Uh, the Germans had surrounded this battalion from Texas. They were called, they went down in history as the Lost Battalion because they were enveloped by the Germans. And, you know, the Germans were closing in on them and it looks like, you know, it was curtains for the Lost Battalion. Well, the U.S. Army wanted to save them, so they had to get somebody to break through the German lines and create an opening so that the Lost Battalion could get away. So, they sent the 442. Uh, the 442 attacked German lines, broke through, succeeded. Uh, they ended up rescuing a little over 200 men from the lost battalion. That's all that was, you know, a battalion has maybe a thousand to start with. And by the time they finally got out, there was down to 200, which is, you know, like the size of a company or something. So they, they had lost a lot of guys, but at least those 200 got out. In the process of rescuing those 200, though, uh, the 442 suffered 800 casualties. You know, casualties means killed and wounded. I haven't been able to find out exactly how many got killed, but if it was kind of typical, it was probably one or 200, something like that, killed, and the rest of them were wounded. All right, so in order to save 200, you lose to killed and wounded 800. Uh, now me, when I look at that arithmetic, I think, hey, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> this doesn't make sense, you know. Uh, uh, if it were me, I would say, hey, you're getting us Japanese slaughtered, you know, so that you can rescue a few white guys, you know. Uh, that's my reaction. That was not the reaction of the 442. Uh, the guys who took part in that combat uh, did not feel resentment, anger, or anything. Uh, they felt pride. 
They were proud. See, I'm losing it again. <coughs> the motto of the 442 was go for broke. All right, that's a gambling term. Japanese love to gamble. Most Asians do, I think. You know, uh, but anyhow, when you go for broke, that means you bet it all. You know, you throw it all down there, and you know, it's all or nothing. You know, well, that's what they did in the war. They went for broke, and you know, that's how you get all those purple hearts. You know, is by going for broke, not holding anything back, going all the way. All right, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff uh, to get to the end. Uh, actually, I'll skip over all of this stuff here. Uh, my father did not participate in, in the rescue of the Lost Battalion because he was already in a hospital. You know, he had been wounded before that. Uh, uh, he was recuperating. Uh, he was laid up for several months. He had to go through a bunch of operations to fix his shoulder. Uh, but finally, he got well enough that uh, uh, he could get around. And when he did get around, he went for some reason, I'm not sure why, uh, to Spokane, Washington. Uh, and that is where he met my mother. And they started dating. They went dancing. My mother loves dancing. Uh, they got married. Uh, and in the next three years, they had three children. This was the post-war baby boom. <laughs> uh, of those three children, uh, the third one was me. And I think uh, with that, I will conclude this uh, slightly long lecture. Okay, thank you.